And um, because this talk is mostly about file format, and we are here at the protocols uh, platform, then I would like to present also a protocol re related to LibreOffice uh, that's called uh, LibreOffice Impress Remote uh, Protocol uh, that allows you to remote control Impress. So I have my um, smartphone here, and I can switch slides. I have some additional notes on the phone. I can read them. and. Uh, and basically, um, it allows you to uh, remote control your computer when you are walking around and uh, giving some presentation. Um, it also works uh, over uh, Bluetooth, so in case um, the conference wireless would be um, would be too slow or unreliable, then um, it kind of works offline, still wireless, um, and it's a good toy and. And um, little people know about that. It's in the for Android and for iOS. It's in the Play Store and the App Store, so you can use it yourself. All you need is really just a recent LibreOffice version and uh, and uh, Bluetooth enabled uh, smartphone and, and notebook. Um, so that's about the protocol part. <laughs> for the, the remaining part of this talk, I'm afraid I will mostly talk about uh, file format. Um, so about myself, I'm from Hungary. Uh, I'm a contractor at uh, Collabora Productivity, who is a uh, business around uh, LibreOffice. We give um, consultancy and support, commercial support around LibreOffice. Um, I have been um, mostly working on LibreOffice Writer in the past uh, three years now. Uh, previously, I was a volunteer at the, at the LibreOffice project. Um, so, uh, what we, what I will be talking about, uh, what is uh, LibreOffice and the Document Foundation, the chari uh, charitable entity behind the LibreOffice project, um, how Collaborative Productivity, the company, uh, fits in, inside this picture, um, how, um, wh what we do about uh, interoperability. I will um, also present uh, the usual our usual approach and also a few concrete examples. And um, I will um, mention a few news about our two uh, latest uh, stable releases. Um, so uh, LibreOffice is uh, currently basically the only uh, major open source, actively maintained uh, open source uh, office productivity suite. Uh, it's cross-platform. It's uh, it runs on Windows, Linux, and and Mac. Um, and um, the really good thing about that is that uh, today's uh, file form, Office file formats are really complex. And to support uh, those features, um, you, it's not enough to just write some importer and exporter code to, to, to um, read and write that. But you need uh, the actual feature implemented in the program's code module. And doing that from scratch is a really, really large work. If you uh, so a number of um, uh, reader apps on, on mobile devices that were written from scratch and missing various features, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, LibreOffice has been, and, and these predecessors, uh, has been around for um, almost 20 years now. So um, it, it has a large number of features that, that enables it to, to give a much better um, interop um, perspective than, than any other open source alternatives. Um, the Document Foundation is uh, the legal nonprofit entity behind LibreOffice. It handles everything except development. I mean, it handles the infrastructure, it handles uh, QA, it operates a uh, mailing list, it organizes events um, except development. Development is done by companies around the project. Um, and uh, one of the, the companies uh, is Collabora, who, who I am working for. Uh, we are a consultancy company. Um, and um, and um, we, are just, we are not the company. We are just one of the companies. The really good thing about the TDF rules is that uh, no uh, single company can control more than 30% uh, of any, any um, committee. Uh, so that it can't happen, but uh, happened in the past uh, with the previous project, the Open Office, where Sun and later Oracle uh, controlled all the, the committees. So even if there were community council and whatnot, 
um, basically it happened what a single company wanted. Um, if um, if you are into um, legal details, then it's a it's a big change that uh, Oracle required copyright assignment, so that if you contributed something, even if it was under an open source license, you had to sign a paper so that they can sell your work as a proprietary product. And um, with LibreOffice, this is a, a big change. LibreOffice is um, most of the code is under the MPL v2 license, and we require no copyright assignment. Uh, we require a single email stating that your code is uh, available under the MPL license, and, and that's it, no copyright assignment. Um, so how small or big LibreOffice is? Um, one, one aspect or matrix uh, to, um, um, to answer this question is the number of uh, unique IP addresses we see. Um, on, if you use the binaries from LibreOffice.org, uh, which is true for everybody except for the users of Linux distributions who typically roll their, their own version, uh, then um, by default, once a week, LibreOffice calls back to home and checks if there is an update. And if yes, then you see a nice bubble um, encouraging you to update to a new new version. So uh, we can um, we can log these IP addresses, and um, of course, what we are mostly interested in is the unique IP addresses. And as you can see on the chart, that's that's quite promising. Just in the uh, last year, we basically doubled that number, um, and you can also see the the uh, ratio of the platforms. Uh, the, actually, the, the, the pie chart is unfair for the Linux platform. As I said, most Linux users get their um, LibreOffice binary from their uh, distribution vendors, and they typically disable uh, this feature. But for, for Windows and Mac, it's, it's kind of uh, representative. Um, the, the next slide is about uh, who, who does the development, if, if, uh, if not TDF. Um, as you can see, there is a healthy mix of a uh, large uh, number of companies, and also there is this uh, um, larger um, block, the, I guess, the, the orange one. Um, wait a minute. No, it's the blue one, the light blue one. Uh, it's the so-called new contributors. Uh, they are um, volunteers. Um, as you can see, basically there are um, three large blocks there. Um, there is Collabora, there is Red Hat, and there are volunteers. And there are many other smaller companies who, who do a lot of work. So uh, you can see um, um, you can see Synorzip is an Indian company. Uh, Galia is here from Spain. Um, uh, there is Ericsson. Uh, there is Kanenakal who, who make Ubuntu, and, and so on. There are many other uh, smaller companies who, who contribute budgets. Um, because we require no, no copyright assignment, it's, it's quite easy even for companies to, to do work. Um, the other aspect is um, the number of committers that, uh, that's, uh, that's different. Like uh, if, if uh, for example, Red Hat, don't have too many people working on the project, but they do a lot of coins. On the other hand, if you look at the, the number of people, that big light blue is the, the new contributors, you can see that uh, more than the half of the contributors are actually volunteers. Um, that, that means that we have a half a mix of volunteers and, and uh, company uh, developers. And uh, it seems that so far, um, we are good enough with, with mixing uh, these two types of contributions, which is generally a problem for, for most open source projects. Um, so, uh, Collabora Productivity is a subsidiary of Collabora, um, um, UK based uh, consultancy company. Um, it um, started to do LibreOffice support one. Um, a few years ago, um, the SUSE LibreOffice team got disbanded, and the majority of the team moved to Collabora. Um, people or, or uh, my colleagues are, are the ones who did most of the work around uh, OXML export filters. So if you ever save to 
um, DOCAX, Axelas Axe, or PPTX, that's uh, mostly our work. Um, that's something that, uh, that was uh, not supported by Sun and later Oracle. Their vision was that they only import UXML, and that's how they will do this UDF versus UXML war. Uh, our approach was that the reality is that there is a huge corpus of non ODF document out there, and forcing people this way uh, with technical solutions to use ODF is uh, not the optimal way. Um, so we spent a lot of time on, on writing the export filters for UXML. Um, I myself got into this LibreOffice story with uh, writers RTF import and export filter, that's mostly my work. Um, so what do we do with interoperability? Um, by interoperability, I mean everything else that's not UDF. Uh, both LibreOffice and Collabor is a strong, a strong supporter of, of UDF. UDF uh, is an um, office technical uh, committee at the OASIS uh, standardization group, and um, both TDF and Collabor has a representative there. And, um, and we think that ODF is the, the true uh, and beautiful and perfect file format, or at least the, the, the best of, of all the available ones. On the other hand, uh, we do realize that we have to do something about everything else. So um, while, we, uh, while we promote ODF, we still um, spend um, uh, huge energy on, on improving um, interoperability with everything else. Um, so even if, uh, even if uh, in an idea world everyone uses uh, uh, LibreOffice or at least some other ODF processor, um, we have this um, uh, OXML and, and other foreign file formats. We like to call them foreign or alien formats uh, versus our own format. Um, and, um, the, the, the important aspect uh, to understand is that um, if, um, if um, you would like to add support for some, some kind of file format, then uh, there are uh, different levels uh, of work required uh, to support the file format. Um, in case uh, the file format um, uh, describes features um, which are variable in LibreOffice code, then you have an easier task. But if the file format describes some feature that's not a variable, then you have to work on not only on the importer and exporter, so we call that the filter code, but also in every other area of LibreOffice. So um, I call these, these small things that build up a file format is the features. And the, the, the features um, can, can be uh, break down to smaller parts. So uh, we have the document model which describes how the, the feature will be represented in the computer's uh, memory. Then uh, we have to provide some kind of API um, so that uh, you can uh, manipulate the document from file filters or from macros or any other uh, programmatic ways. Then we have to somehow represent that feature. I call that the layout, so it's kind of the document view. Um, then there comes the filter part, um, which is the one initially was thought about the only, only uh, necessary part for, for adding a new feature. Um, even if you did all this work, if you don't add tasks, that sooner or later someone will break it, and no one will notice the breakage. That's a bad thing, so tasks are needed. Um, tasks are typically using the API, so you can get away with touching the, the user interface. But sooner or later, somebody will um, want to um, use that feature in a from scratch created document. So it, the user interface is needed. And then we have the documentation, the user hub, um, or for the API, we have the developer documentation that has to be updated to describe the new feature. Uh, if you don't describe your new feature, then uh, no one will use it. And um, finally, uh, when we added a brand new feature, then we would like to save it to UDF as well. And that means because it's an open standard, we can uh, write up um, an enhancement proposal and uh, submit uh, this proposal to be part of the specification. So um, for every new feature we add and serialize to UDF, we write a specification 
and we propose it to be part of ODA. That's how um, it won't be the case that LibreOffice adds random file format extensions to, the, to this file format. And even if these extensions are standard, if everyone adds uh, loads of extensions, then it will be a mess in the long run. So it's really important that, uh, that um, when new features are added, that either somebody from the from TDF or, or, or in our case, um, uh, our representative of Collabora at the uh, ODFTC uh, has to promote the feature so that uh, it becomes part of the next version of the file format. Um, so, um, the, in the, as I said, in the worst case, uh, you have to go through all these steps of, the, of adding a new feature. In the, in the, in the best case, um, the only the missing part is, is the filter part, and then you have a quite uh, limited scope of work to do um, to add support for some feature um, from a given file format. Um, at this point, hopefully, uh, most of you understand that there is no XLS to PDF function in LibreOffice. We load the, the, for example, the XLS file to memory, um, in this case, to the document model in memory of Cog, and then we have a separate filter um, that uh, writes the document to a PDF file. Um, that's how we don't have to uh, write code for every different combination of conversions. But we have um, a, a, um, a document model, import filters, build up the document model, and then export filters will serialize the document model from the memory to a file stream. Um, um, and other uh, project under the Document Foundation umbrella next to LibreOffice is the Document Liberation Project. Uh, their um, primary aim is to support uh, file formats where um, um, some proprietary uh, product created those files, but the company went away. Um, you can no longer um, run the binary. It was running on DOS or OS slash 2 or, or, or something. And you still have the documents, and now uh, you have a problem. And uh, the document liberation project um, uh, tries to con uh, create libraries which can read these obscure form formats. Or even if the, the software didn't went away, let's say you have a Quora draw file, you, you would like to uh, view it, but uh, you don't want to uh, buy the, the product, then you can use our Quora draw uh, filter and import it into LibreOffice. You can later save it as an ODF, and then um, you have it in a format that's documented. And, uh, and well understood. Um, so a number of uh, file formats that supported by the liberation um, project is uh, the Microsoft Visio, um, Apple's Keynote, uh, Microsoft Publisher, Microsoft Works, uh, Coradro, Adobe PageMaker, um, and I think this summer uh, there is a student uh, who works uh, under the Lib uh, Google Summer of Code umbrella on uh, Adobe Freehand filter, and uh, maybe there was one more f format. So um, there are a number of these obscure formats where uh, we can improve, uh, import them to LibreOffice, and then um, you can handle it as a as a normal ODF document um, after that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the document liberation project mostly does import filters. Um, actually, I think there is one exception to that. So that it's not a technical limitation, but it's mostly like uh, when you read the task time that uh, somebody is crying for a given file filter, then you put up an idea that um, that may be interesting. And then if some somebody comes and says that um, this would be interesting to implement, then um, the infrastructure is provided there. Um, so that uh, um, uh, they have tools like uh, uh, understanding binary formats, which have, for example, Microsoft Visio is a binary format, and, um, and um, it has no documentation. And then um, uh, there are guys who are mostly interested in just understanding the file format so that they produce documentation for them, and then the next guy can actually implement an import filter for them. Um, um, and the one exception to that is that um, we not only import, but also um, export uh, e EPUB format. So technically, it's, um, 
it's there to also export this format. But um, if the use case is that you have the file, but you no longer have the software, then you are only interested in, in, in import. That's one thing. The other thing is that, especially for binary format, uh, just importing and, um, and ex extracting the details from the file, but you understand, understand is much easier than writing the binary file, file format. So that's why, for example, for Visio, the import is, is uh, quite variable. But uh, writing it back would be much, uh, much uh, more harder. Um, so that's for obscure formats uh, where, where the software went away and we can save your life with, with these import filters. Um, but there is also the case when, when there is some upcoming standard and we take part in promoting that new standard. Um, if you are were ever into uh, game development, you very well known uh, OpenGL text textures. Um, but um, there wasn't um, really a format uh, for these uh, tessellated for, um, uh, graphics that you can just upload uh, straight to the GPU. And GLTF is a, is a new format allowing that. And LibreOffice Impress uh, can contain these GLTF models. So you can just insert um, um, uh, such a GLTF model. And either this doc is a GLTF model. Um, either you can just view it, or because it's a, a model, you can um, turn it around, or you can predefine some, some, uh, some kind of pass where the camera will walk. So I don't know, you can put in a labyrinth and, and play games with that. But the, the point is that it's, a, it's an upcoming standard. It's a, it sounds quite promising if all the GPU vendors would, would um, um, accept and implement this, then finally we would have an open standard for this kind of problem. And the LibreOffice takes part of, um, of promotion of this standard. Um, so, um, when handling interoperability, um, I will talk about four different levels of handling. Um, the first, uh, the easiest, is when the feature is already uh, implemented in core and, and only um, the filter part is missing. Um, the, the second uh, level is uh, in case um, it's missing, but we add um, a full implementation for that feature. So we implement the core part, and then you can use that from the five filters or from macros and, and so on. Um, um, I, I will um, show examples um, using this approach. Um, and there are two more approaches, uh, which are about there is some, some complex or very complex feature, and we would like to get something, but it's not perfect. Um, one example is. Um, for, from the docx file format, uh, the file format supports uh, table size, but the writer core doesn't support them. And what we do is that during import, uh, during the import, the importer uh, applies the result of this table size, so that when you open the document, then you get something that that looks the same as it was described in the file format. That, but this was a much uh, um, smaller effort than than um, implementing the full feature in core. And in case you have to choose that you do nothing, or you just tweak the import filter, then in tweaking the import filter is still better than nothing. And uh, there is the, the fourth type, when uh, even, uh, even on import time, you don't uh, turn uh, the information into, into a form that's visible on the screen, but still uh, you preserve it. And if the document will be saved back to the very same file format, then um, at least that feature will be preserved. So um, one example is that this is a before and after um, picture. As you can see, before it was a pretty big white screen and showing nothing. And it was about uh, group shape support uh, inside the RTF importer. And um, group shapes are something that's, that's perfectly supported. Uh, the problem was uh, in the high format filter. So after implementing this feature in the import filter, then we got a pretty good result. Um, the, the second um, example is something when um, you had a, a text box in uh, again in, the, in writer. So this is about the docx file format or or for from RTF. And uh, for the writer text frames, what we use uh, in our document model to represent these 
um, shape containing tags. Um, they only supported uh, solid colors as a background. Um, on the other hand, um, there was already some kind of support in LibreOffice for, for more advanced backgrounds. Uh, like in Impress, you could have a gradient or a hash background or, or a bitmap. And uh, the task here was to improve the write or tax frame implementation to also um, um, handle these more advanced backgrounds. So you can now have uh, gradient backgrounds for write or tax frame. And needless to say, the majority of the work was to get the document model, the API, the layout, uh, uh, the user interface, right? And once that was all done, then um, the actual OXML filter work was much easier. Um, as I, um, I already mentioned table styles uh, as one example. When we recognize the feature in the file format, we can import it, but uh, the, the import process is loosey, and you just get to see uh, something that's, that's close to the original one. Uh, but we lose information during the import process, and it's a, it's a better than nothing approach. Um, the same is true uh, for document teams that's uh, currently not supported natively, but we recognize and apply the curves according to that um, during the import process. In a smart art import is, is again something similar. Uh, we can read the pre rendered shape definition from the smart art um, uh, description. And we can show you something that's, that's really similar to the smart art. But uh, actually, if you would uh, edit uh, the, the smart art, then uh, if you would have the order semantic uh, definition of the smart art, then, then you would have a much easier uh, situation. Uh, so it, it looks um, OK after import, but it's not um, a fully implemented feature. Um, and the third case is when um, we recognize something, we can pre preserve it, uh, but nothing is presented on the screen, and, uh, and it just saved back when, when you, you use um, the same file format for saving. Uh, that was um, added for ODF and OXML. In both cases, the, the, the use case is that in case you have a huge document, you would like to uh, do some, some minor tweak to that document, and you would like to save it back, then it's a good idea not to destroy some, some complex features on completely unrelated places of the document. Um, and um, for ODF, this is, uh, this is important because just like we do ODF extensions, and, and until they are a part of the upcoming next uh, ODF version, they are uh, written as ODF extensions to the file, others can do the same. And so as long as we accept that uh, LibreOffice is not the only ODF implementation, which is a good thing, then we have to play far with the other ODF implementers. Uh, so we, um, we can store uh, these um, unrecognized um, element attributes uh, to the document model, and we can write them back. And this is the same. It's uh, really similar in case of OXML. We can store um, key value properties on different objects, like uh, tables, paragraphs, or the whole document. And um, then we can write them back. And uh, um, as, um, if you can choose between, um, you have some, some limited resource to, to do something about a feature, and you have no resource to add the full support for that, and it's better than nothing to at least just preserve it. Um, so um, in the ODF case, uh, we have uh, a number of um, API uh, where uh, we have these attribute suppliers on different um, API objects, like the paragraphs uh, for the text, I mean the text portion, so the, the smaller parts of the paragraphs where even the character formats are, are, um, are the same. Um, OXML called these runs. Um, and um, and um, you can uh, put these key value uh, properties on on, uh, on different API objects, and um, um, and that's how we can we can um, preserve these these um, attributes. Uh, one one interesting corner case here is that what uh, do we do when you edit these uh, these objects? Like uh, let's say that the paragraph borders, for example, wouldn't be supported. Uh, by LibreOffice. It's supported, but let's say that, um, or let's imagine that it wouldn't be the case. 
then you get a plain paragraph, and then you just hit enter, and you are um, at the second paragraph typing something, and you have the impression that you have two simple paragraphs. Now you save it back, and if we just duplicate the paragraph properties, while um, the, that's how normally we, we handle the paragraph properties when you add the new paragraph, then you would have added uh, two paragraphs with large, for example, large black borders, and that's not, uh, not expected. So we have to carefully uh, drop away um, these, um, these additional user-defined properties as you added the, the um, given object, so it can't happen that uh, something totally unexpected is saved to the file, and when you open the ODF document with, the, with the, that other application that originally produced that, then you would um, get some, some surprise. So um, one, uh, one, one of these um, improvements that uh, we did explicitly for, for interop improvement um, uh, goal, um, one, is, one is in LibreOffice Writer that appeared in uh, 4.2, is borders around character borders. That's supported by HTML. It's supported by OXML. But um, in LibreOffice, you could uh, kind of hack it around. Like uh, you could create a text frame with the border, and you could anchor it as a character, and then you could get something like that. Uh, but um, it's easy to understand that it's far from the ideal. Um, so um, now um, LibreOffice Writer supports these character borders. Um, by character borders, I mean also uh, the, this uh, drop case feature, um, also the shading, uh, spacing around the character border, and, and all other uh, sub-features which belong to the to borders. Yep? Um, actually, um, um, when, when I, I do um, a full implementation of a feature like this, um, then I go through that list that I presented in the, the earlier slide where I, it started with the document model and then did with the specification. So ODF works by um, first doing the work, implementing a feature, uh, implementing the file filter as an ODF extension. And once we have a working implementation, then we can make a proposal the multiple implementations are required. And when there are multiple independent implementations, then it might be part of the standard. This ensures that it's not the, it can be the case that uh, we have some implementation detail in the feature that, uh, that was forgotten from the specification, and then nobody recognizes that. Um, only later, when it's already part of the standard, then a second entity would, would implement that, and they are in a trouble because that feature is not properly described. Um, so, in the case of ODF, we typically first implement an extension and later uh, do it as a, um, as a proposal. It could be the other way around. The point is that uh, everyone should do it in the, in the same order, otherwise it's a chicken and egg problem and everyone is waiting for the others. So, uh, in case of ODF, uh, I guess the fourth major revision will, will come out, the, the 1.3, in, hopefully in the near future. Of future, so so it's uh, it's um, moving um, much more slowly than, for example, the LibreOffice major version, where uh, we release a major version twice a year. So uh, it's pointless to wait for the the committee to to accept it, the extension um, into the standard. But we make sure is that for every extension we implement, we submit a proposal, and then we have to react to the comments and. Um, so that was the character borders. Um, the next thing is that something that where I was uh, personally um, involved. Um, LibreOffice Writer originally only supported um, commands anchored to a single character position, and um, but the OXML and all the word formats um, supported attaching uh, commands to a given text range where you have a different start and end position. And um, that's something I did. And the new new detail here is that uh, when I did that, um, I just completely forgot about nesting of these text ranges. 
and funny things uh, happen when uh, you try to do that. And uh, in uh, 4.3, uh, 4 um, we fixed all, all these corner cases, so now you can properly have over, overlapping or even nested um, uh, ranges. And again, um, for ODF, it wasn't uh, that hard to, to implement that, but um, I went through all the existing major filters, and so for DOCAX, for DOC, for RTF, and uh, that's properly round trade. So um, both the export and the import part should work uh, properly now. Um, uh, one of the major reworks we had on the OXML front in Writer. I, I keep talking about Writer because that's what I do, but you can imagine that, uh, thanks, um, that um, in Calc and in Press there are similar reworks. Um, in OXML first, um, in, in the word case, um, VML, an older markup was used to describe shapes, and then uh, the 2010 version introduced the drawing ML markup for shape description, even in Word. And uh, for quite some time, LibreOffice writers still uh, read the VML fallback definition. Uh, that was um, not perfect. Even the description couldn't be perfect in some cases because the drawing ML markup is, um, can describe more features. And also our, uh, our VML filter was, uh, was uh, worse because uh, Calc and Impress um, focused only or mostly on the drawing ML handling. So after switching writer to also use the drawing ML handling and fixing a number of corner cases, here is an example document that's barely readable uh, when imported from VML. But once we switch to the drawing ML markup reading, then the output is much better. Um, um, again, something uh, you previously you could have a writer text frame, which is just a rectangle, and have some complex content in, in that, like a smart art of some uh, track changes, text, or, or something other or advanced. Uh, but you couldn't have a custom geometry. Or you could have a custom geometry, but then you could have limited content, like um, the ones I mentioned, or you couldn't insert a table there, and so on. And um, this textbooks feature is about um, to combine the two feature sets, and that improves um, the OXML import and export result a lot. Um, and um, I would like to present a few general uh, new features in LibreOffice, just so that you can you, you are aware what we are doing, but when not working on something uh, related to interoperability. Um, one rework was that uh, we had these fixed layout dialogues. You couldn't resize them. Um, each uh, uh, position and size of each control was fixed, so that uh, we had a large button with a small English string, because in one of the more than 100 language translations, uh, some more space was needed, and stuff like this. And now um, all the dialogues are reworked to to properly use a layout just like everyone else does uh, today. And um, you can resize the dialog for English, and uh, the sizes and uh, dialogs can be much smaller and so on. Um, then um, uh, one of the performance improvements we have done recently is uh, when loading from XLSX, um, the different sheets are uh, in, the XM, uh, in the zip package um, are in different uh, separate XML streams, so we can load them parallel. Um, then um, we did some uh, uh, improvements um, related to OpenGL in the chart module, so that uh, in case you have some complex uh, chart, and um, counting the, the output on the CPU would be too slow, then we can use the, your graphic card for that uh, rendering. Um, 4.4 uh, was the first version where uh, we had an Android version of, um, of LibreOffice in the form of a viewer. Um, actually, that's something, it, it's really hard to share your Android uh, screen on the, on the laptop, so I, I wouldn't go into that, but uh, if someone is interested, then I'm happy to show it uh, after the talk. Um, for the 4.5.0, uh, then uh, we will also have basic editing uh, capabilities. Um, then uh, we, um, we um, introduced um, a kind of um, an info bar where um, you can um, 
for example, when you open a document uh, in a read-only mode, then, then you can switch easily to editing mode. It's uh, the same info bar that you use is used by um, uh, the CMIS uh, backend when you open f uh, file from some uh, document management repository. If uh, CMIS sounds uh, interesting, then Hakobo will have a separate talk just dedicated to CMIS, so uh, go there and listen to him. Um, and um, the 5.0 uh, will have a... Uh -huh, okay. Uh, 5.0 uh, will have a number of uh, new uh, interop features. Uh, one example here, that's again for a writer. Um, we, have, um, we have a single background color for, for paragraphs and characters and whatnot. And Word has two uh, separate definitions for that. What, one is highlighting and the other one is shading. And uh, most users want, want highlighting when exporting to the Word format. But uh, now this is configurable and you can decide what, uh, what you would like to have. Um, we have a better conditional formatting in CAG. Uh, we have a PDF signing, so you can digitally sign your PDF, um, including the various complex time stamping and, and whatnot, so that um, the Adobe reader is completely happy about your signing. Um, we have um, um, a number of sidebars, um, including a new ones um, that are represented here. Um, if you, you are um, not uh, enjoying the menu items and separate dialogues to do uh, operations on the document model. Um, there is a whole new API called LibreOffice Kit that's introduced primarily for the Android uh, editing, but later the same uh, API will be used for the LibreOffice Online. Um, there is um, for 4.0 uh, a very basic prototype will be only already formed online, so I didn't talk much about that, but that's again something I can show on my notebook if you are interested. Um, there is the basic editing uh, feature, and um, the 64-bit uh, Windows port will be again new in this major version. And that concludes my talk, uh, so uh, thanks for listening, and And in case you have questions, then I may try to answer them. Yep. Yes. Uh, yes, so I wanted to say Calligra was existed, um, but also, do you do you get to talk to Microsoft um, when you're implementing features from O XML? Do you get to say, "Hello, Microsoft, I don't quite understand this detail," because there will be people in this room whose job it will be to make that detail. I have been talking to Tom uh, ah. <laughs> yesterday in the evening. Um, uh, so yes, on the other hand, typically we just read the, the documentation, we experiment with their implementation, and in most cases that gives you the answer. Um, when um, earlier uh, there was some, some collaboration uh, for, for improving the OXML filter, like uh, for example, if you import and export mathematical uh, equations inside the writer document, that was something that was uh, done uh, on that, uh, under that umbrella. And there, that was uh, active communication. Um, in most cases, um, um, we can passively uh, implement something. Um, but um, um, we had sort of had some contact before also. But uh, I think the current event is a huge opportunity to improve the communication level. Uh, Question? OK, so talk is over. Um, Thanks for listening. And